Welcome to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce, and I am so delighted and glad to be with you today. Uh, I'm in. I'm doing a series in the Corinthians. I'm calling it Corinthians Letters because I intend to do First and Second Corinthians. I'm not so sure that I will go verse by verse, but I'll hit the highlights of First Corinthians because I want to go right into Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians is pretty much of a mysterious book. A lot of people don't understand it, and hardly, I hardly have ever heard it taught. So I would like to venture into that. Uh, 2 Corinthians, because it's really one of my favorites. But right now we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're talking about what it means to be carnal, what it means to be yet a babe. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I, and let me just read the first three verses before I head into what I'm really going to talk about today, because I'm going to take a little side, um, a little PS, a little side note to um, talk, to get to do something that I rarely do, which is go into my own pers- personal testimony. But first of all, let me read the, these verses. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, as to fleshly, even as to babes in Christ. So, I mean, we can't be upset because these people are babes because we all have to mature in faith in in who we really are in Christ. But it does take some maturity and it takes some pruning. As Jesus says in John 15, when he's talking about the vine and the branch, we need to be pruned some and actually we're being conformed. And so, uh, and we're growing in faith, usually through tribulations, through things that are not working out so well, because we're, then we're going to have to find another answer. We're going to have to be stretched to find out why, why can't, why don't, why aren't we living the victorious life all the time? So he was talking to these Corinthians like they were still babes, and he was trying to get them matured. Now that's basically what Paul is doing through all of his letters, um, he, he labors. He says this in Galatians. He says, I labor till Christ be formed in you, take, till Christ takes a form in you and is actually manifesting his agape love through you. And that's where we're going to head to in 1 Corinthians because one of the centerfold probably of 1 Corinthians is chapter 13, the love chapter. So, um, you know, he, he says, you know, you can have the Holy Spirit. You're not even a Christian until you have the Holy Spirit. Of course, they had the Holy Spirit, but they were such a mixture. And they did not really, they weren't operating from the mind of Christ. And um, they didn't really know who they were. And they were seeing themselves still separate from God. They did not know their union with Christ. And why still carnal? And why are we Christians still carnal? And uh, what is carnality? Is carnality just you know, not doing certain things that we think, oh my gosh, I better not watch an R-rated movie, I, that's carnal, and, you know, I better be reading my Bible. You know, we have all these ideas of what carnality is, and we're always so outer in our thinking about what we're doing and not doing, and certainly, you know, the a spiritual life will manifest itself spiritually, that's for sure. But if you're living a carnal life, it's going to manifest itself fleshly. And of course, Paul says you're walking as just mere men. You're walking as just you are just yourself living the Christian life really apart from Christ. Yes, you have the Holy Spirit, but you're living as if you're here alone with the Holy Spirit's help. And you're, we're always thinking, well, Jesus is going to help me or he's walking beside me. I mean, so often we quote that uh, footsteps in the sand and we think, oh, he's walking, he's carrying me. Well, he's actually walking inside you. I mean, if Paul, if Paul says, I labor in faith till Christ be formed in you or Christ take a form in you and so that his manifested 
love pours out of you. That's really maturity in Christ because, and his love is sacrificial. So if we're still fleshly, we're still holding on to a lot of soul ties. We're still living in our flesh. We're still living in our soul. We're still needy. We're pretty needy. And the reason that I want to take a little diversion, because I just want to tell you my own testimony of my own life and where I was raised, how I grew up. I, I think you've probably gotten a hint of it here and there, but never really have I talked about my Christian life or my life, really. So it's kind of a autobiographical uh, program about me. <laughs> well, let me tell you first, um, uh, I was born here in Louisville, Kentucky, in the South End. My dad was a milkman. We were just common people. Um, uh, I had uh, two brothers and a sister, and uh, my sister was older than me. We lived, in, like I said, in the South End. It was it was wartime. I mean, I was born in 1941. That kind of dates me. I don't mind that. I'm actually 70 years old, and. Um, uh, during that time, I mean, I was born in 1941, and Pearl Harbor was bombed in uh, December 7th, 1941. So I was six months old at the time. So um, at that time, my dad was taken off in the war, so he was in World War II. He was actually in the Navy. My mother was a pretty fearful person. She was, she was scared all of her life. I found out later why, but basically she was always so ashamed of herself and fearful and, did, and wanted us, she didn't want us to be like her, and, but she was tr pretty dictatorial. So she dictated to us and she railed all the time. My mother was a railer. I mean, I don't know if you all have had mothers like that, but mine was. And I always felt like I never did anything right. And um, growing up, I realized I had some kind of um, disability because at, at the time I didn't know what was wrong, but I was dyslexic. And so I did not read very well at first or spell very well. And you know, um, that puts kind of a dent in your personality, you think. And so you start thinking all these negative things about yourself. Ex and especially if you have a mother that continually tells you that you are wrong and, and she's so ashamed of everything you do. So you live under shame and condemnation and, um, and, 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 and fear myself. But what I did not realize, I was just as lost as she was. We were lost, a lost family. And there my dad was in the war and mother was trying to support us. She, now think of this, she only got $75 a month. When I think of her fear, she did not know what in the world was going to happen. And $75 a month? And, and my brother got epilepsy. So he had these seizures and she just, I mean, she would scream at him, why were you even born? Why? Because I can't take care of you. So it was a terrible existence of great fear and lack. And a lot of, personally, I took it as a lot of self-condemnation. And so did my other siblings. They did as well. The whole family was that way. Now, um, I did know, though, that my dad really loved me. I did know that. And, um, but I never knew that my mother loved me. You know, I've thought later, um, later on in my life, I thought, you know, that's just a horrible thing to think that your mother doesn't love you. I never knew that because I always felt like I was wrong. I felt like I disappointed her. I always felt, you know, I felt like if I did not measure up, you know, I was just defeated and wrong and felt dyslexic. So I felt like I didn't do good in school and she would tell me I was dumb and I believed it. Now these are all lies and they're all coming from satanic thinking and carnal thinking, fleshly mind. The fleshly mind is enmity against God. You know, it says that in Romans 8 that the mind of the flesh is against God. Wow. We, we hardly think of that, but it's true. And as long as we're lost people, that's all we can think with is the fleshly mind. Just seeing 
our circumstances for what they are, not seeing any, not having any faith in God whatsoever and just trusting really what I'm doing and what to do and how to live the, how to live my life. And it's all really apart from Christ. And it really is satanic thinking. And so, but God so loved me. He loved me. He loved our whole family. He loves all of us. And um, nine years old, I remember going, started going to a little Baptist church, learning some of the Baptist songs. My mom, by that time the war was over, my dad was back home, and she would take us mail, maybe on Easter Sunday, or we would go Christmas time, and sometimes in the summer I would just go myself, because I could walk there, it wasn't that far, and I could walk and I... Uh, learned, you know, some songs that have been with me all of my life. It's really interesting how that happens, uh, you know, but they have been. And that uh, songs are wonderful for children because it's something you're always going to remember. And the Holy Spirit can use that in your life. And I remember when I was like 11 years old, I started going to a Sunday school class, a girl's Sunday school class in my Baptist church. And, uh, the teacher said, we're going to have a sleepover, and I want, before you girls come, I want you girls to bring your favorite verse in the Bible. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I had never even read the Bible before. Our, the Bible was just like something we put on the coffee table, and we kind of put, we knew it was a holy book, but it was too holy for me because, you know, I was just this little lost kid. So I thought, wow. So I got my, I got a Bible, found a Bible, and I thought, how do I know what my favorite verse is? So I opened it up and pointed my finger down like you do when you're a child and not knowing any better. And my finger fell on a verse that I remember still today. My goodness, how God is after us before we even know it. And so um, the verse was, I will be with you even into the ends of the earth. And I'm telling you, that registered within me somehow. I, I, I didn't really know Jesus personally as my Savior, but He was uh, giving me a promise right there at 11 years old. I'll be with you, Sylvia, even to the ends of the earth. And you know what? My heart registered with that verse. So I was proud to read it when my teacher said, what's your favorite verse, Sylvia? I read it. And to this day, I, keep, I, re, I, I will never forget that verse. So as time went on, I matured, and the more I matured, the more fear my mother had uh, about me and about what I might do as a young person, and mothers do fear that about their children, especially their daughters. Are you going to be a good girl or, or what? And so, you know, but, but you see, she started accusing me of things that I didn't even understand at the time. I had no... Ex I didn't have any understanding whatsoever about what she was accusing me of. And so by the time I was 16, you know, I started, I, I moved to Middletown, went to Eastern High School here in Middletown. And, um, and by the way, I'm living now in between Middletown and Jefferson Town in, in Jefferson County, right in Louisville. That's where I am right today. So I've lived here all my life. And, um, and uh, started going to high school, started going to Eastern High School, and um, started dating, of course. Well, that was my mother's worst fear because basically she uh, did some things in her young life, which I don't need to say, but it made her ashamed. And she certainly didn't want me to have any of that. She, didn't, she did not want to have the pain. My mother lived in pain and fear and agony her as long as I can remember her. So her whole life was, how can I keep myself from ever having pain anymore? So many people do that. And I did that after I did a few things myself. And so, um, and so because of it, she always blasted us, always put, you know, don't you do that, don't. And she was always erupting like she was a volcano. And I was always, I felt like I was the one that she erupted on all the time. So so I was, you know, getting my own thoughts about things. 16, started dating, started dating a guy. Well, he got really serious about me and wanted to marry me. Well, you know, I'm only 16 years old. I don't, I'm not having a good home life. My dad's not home that much, you know, and my mother is railing at me. 
So guess what? The first guy that came along, I decided, mm, I just went for it, and, and I got married, a virgin. I got married, though. And so there I am, and put my family through, through a terrible time. But I was trying to find myself. I was trying to get away from her. I was trying to get away from that voice of condemnation, that shame and that guilt and that fear that I had, that she had imparted to me. And really, it wasn't her that imparted it to me. She only stimulated it in me. Really, it was the devil that imparted that to me because that's really a part of the fall. When we we as fallen people, that's, we are separate from God. All we can do is fear our life and fear our future and regret our past and live in shame and regret and fear, you see, and then try to control our life so that it, we won't have pain again. I mean, the whole world is trying to do that, control their life so that they won't have pain. So three months living with my husband at 16, my goodness, he kicks me out. Why? Because he's already try. He's already finding other girls. I, I, he had finished with me, and guess who? I, I called my daddy. Come get me. My daddy came and got me, and there I was, pregnant, <laughs> at 16 years old, with with my first son. He's he's only uh, uh, 17 years younger than me, because I was 17 years old when I had him. Young person. <laughs> And so there I was, a, a junior in high school, and pregnant. Wow, what do I do? And home, you think, I thought that uh, I lived with fear and shame and guilt before I left home. Well, there I came home pregnant, <laughs> and the, the shame and the fear and the guilt and the condemnation just multiplied a hundred times because it wasn't just my mother putting it on me and me trying to reject it and trying to be somebody. It was me now putting it upon myself because really, look, what was I, what was I doing at 17 years old? I was getting ready to have a child. I was still in high school. In those days, in the, today, I mean, there's a lot of pregnant girls in high school, but in those days, that was a terrible shame. Shameful thing, it was in the 50s. And there I was in high school, pregnant. Well, my mom, they thought they knew how to abort that child. And they gave me medicine and gave me things to take to abort the child. Well, it didn't happen. And so I didn't know then what they were trying to do, but I do now, I do know what they were trying to do. So, but I lived, with the agony of all this, and went to high school on top of it. Well, you know, my mother started uh, giving me girdles to put on so that my stomach wouldn't show and the pregnancy wouldn't show. But, and I stayed as quiet as I could and made it through my, my uh, junior year of high school up to May. And then all of a sudden they called me into the office uh, and the girl's um, office and they said, Sylvia, you know, you cannot continue because you're pregnant and you cannot continue. I only had one more month and I would have finished my junior year. You're going to have to finish it at home. Well, I was doing well in all the classes but geometry, and maybe you can identify with me on that one. That was a hard one for me. Well, but you know what? God was taking care of me all that time. He was taking care of me. And my geometry teacher found out what happened to me, and she came to my house every week to um, to tutor me so that I could pass my that course, which I did, and I went on into being a senior. I passed my junior year, basically, because the Lord sent that teacher to my, my house. Well, my son was born in July, July the 15th. My son was born, and I went to the hospital, and I was there alone at only 17, and I had him alone. <laughs> My everything, you see, in those days, everything was so shameful, and I lied, said, you know, they would say, well, where's your husband? I'd say, well, um, you know, he, he had to be in the service. Well, that was a lie. We were already headed for a divorce, so after the child was born, yes, 
we did divorce. So, and I finished, went ahead and finished my senior year at high school. But that whole time I had my little son and I knew that I had to support him. So I decided that I was gonna, after high school, I was gonna go into x-ray training because I had to, I knew that I was gonna have to support him. So I, had, I needed some education. I needed some qualifications to get a job to support him. So I registered for x-ray training school and went into x-ray training school. Well, the whole time, the interesting thing about my mom, she wanted me to abort my child, but after I had him, she pretty much adopted him as hers. And it was almost like she was, she was really stealing even him away from me because I remember um, uh, when he started saying mama, <laughs> that she had him call her mama. Well, I mean, this is all deep, deep pain that I would have because of what my mother was doing. Not only did she want me to have an abortion and then not having an abortion, then she was gonna steal my son away from me. So I had terrible pain from childhood. Not only about what my mother had done, but exactly how, you know, what I went through as a, as a person. And so, uh, but my friends, and I had some friends in high school that really saw me through and they were, they were kind and they were sweet. And, you know, so somehow, you know, the Lord gets us through these things. So I did, I started going to x-ray training. Well, while I was in high school, I, and I met my present husband today, Scott Pierce. And I have something to confess, <laughs> along with all this, this other confession. Let me just tell you this. My maiden name was Pierce as well. <laughs> and so people think, well, what did you do, marry your brother? So, yeah, I do have kind of a sordid life, but no, I didn't marry my brother. Now, actually, we found out we're fifth cousins, but we had the same last name. That was another shameful thing my mother put upon me. Oh, my gosh. You cannot be dating, you know, this boy. He He's your cousin. You can't. So, you know, whatever she said not do, of course, you know, as a young person, you're going to do it. I never took her guidance up to then, and I surely wasn't at that time either. But... Okay, but along the time, along about that time, Billy Graham came to Louisville, Kentucky, and um, uh, I was going to the Baptist Church up there, up up in in Middletown, and um, one of my friends says, "You know, we're going to go to his um, uh, convention. Do you would you go to this convention that, that Billy Graham's coming here to Louisville? Will you go with us?" And I thought, well, I don't know. I've never been to anything like that. So I decided to go. Well, the power of the Spirit overtook me. when I, This was when I was about 18 years old. The power of the Spirit so overtook me that when he gave the invitation just and they sang the song just as I am, I, I jumped up from where my friends were. We were in the bleachers way above where he was speaking. And it didn't matter to me where, how to find my way back to find these people so that they could take me back home because there was thousands of people there. I had to go forward. I had to. And so that day I can remember just marching myself forward to surrender my heart to Christ. So I did when I was 18 years old. And they told me, now go to your local church. So after that, I started going to church. Well, I thought, now I'm going to live a good Christian life. Okay, I know that I've made mistakes. I know I've sinned. That's why I went forward. I knew I had been a sinner. Okay, now I'm going to, I've given my heart to Christ, and, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to be a good person now. I'm going to start reading my Bible. And this probably is everybody's heart. Everybody's heart is, gosh, I've surrendered my heart to Jesus. Now I'm going to be good. I'm not going to do the bad things anymore. Well, so I started making my promises to God. I'm never going to get married again. I don't even know if I'm going to ever date again. You know, all these rigid things that you say to yourself, you're never going to do. Well, so anyway, uh, I started x-ray training and um, 
And uh, little did I know that um, uh, my, hu my husband, my present husband, who was my fifth cousin, started calling me to date. Well, pretty soon we started dating. Well, we started getting serious about each other. And he said, Sylvia, I want to marry you. Well, I was only 19 years old. And I thought, I'm not ready for that. I haven't even lived life yet. But <laughs> little did, you, little did I know that it was, it, it was a part of what I was to experience in my life. So I thought, now, I'm, never go I'm not going to run away from home like I did when I was only 16 years old. I can't do that to my parents this time. This time, I'm going to tell them that we're going to get married. We don't really even plan on getting married for a whole year or more, but, um, but, I, but I've got to tell them. I don't, want to, I don't want to lie to them like I did before. So I went to my mom, and I said, Mom and Dad, you know, uh, Scott and I are going together, and we're, we're planning on getting uh, married, but not in, it won't be for a year or so. Well, my mother... I always say she was like a volcano ready to explode, and this was like the one zillionth time that she exploded, and I mean she blew off like crazy. And you know, she told me you're never going to see him again. You you can never you cannot date him. You you cannot be engaged to him. You will not marry him. And of course, what is a person going to do when that happens? So anyway, he leaves, and. And so I and I gave his ring back to him because he gave me an engagement ring, and I gave it back to him. And I and so I thought I don't know what I'm going to do. So I was going to X-ray training, and he would come down to to um, uh, the hospital where I was, and um, and so as he he would come down, and we'd start dating in secret. Well. This went on for about a month or so, and then finally, um, one day I was at home, and my mother said to me, this is just really great that you're not seeing him anymore, and I thought, I can't lie. So I said, Mom, I said, I am dating him. I have not given him up. We have not given up what we plan to do, and she, you know, volcano number 1001 went off again, so... <laughs> At, by that time, I thought, I've got to call him. So I get him on the call, phone, and I said, you've got to come get me and come get my son, David, and I. We, 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 and by that time, he had already bought a house. He had, we'd already planned on getting married, and it was already set. So he um, comes and gets me, gets my, and, and gets my son, and we pack up our stuff, put it in his car, and we leave. And a week later... Um, I'm in his, his stepmother's house. And this is a whole other story. I'm going to have to finish this the next time we come together. And, but I'm going to stop right here before my present husband and I. Now, this has been 51 years ago. My husband and I have been married 51 years. And um, so uh, I'm going to stop right here and tell you what happened right before we got married because... Another blow happened, which all this is a part of what brought me to the fullness of Christ. It brought me, me to the reality of understanding. I had to understand the fullness of what God had for me. I knew my life had been a mess. I knew that I had messed up the zil in a zillion ways, and I had sinned, and I had done it my own way. I knew, I knew that. Now, but I had to know how me, as a human being, did not have to live in shame, did not have to live in condemnation, did not have to live in fear, did not have to live in regret. They could actually find the fullness of God and Christ, the fullness of the gospel, which is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now, I'm going to continue this next time. So thank you for bearing with me as I take this little diversion uh, from 1 Corinthians and tell you about my own carnal life so that you can understand that, you know, we're all the same fellows in the same ship. And yes, I do. I, I really am a teacher of the Word of God, and I love teaching, and I know what I know in the Spirit, but I know it because I've had many, many, many hard knocks in my life, just like you have. So I, I hope that encourages you. 
And next time when we come together, I'm going to finish my testimony. So thank you for joining me and may God richly bless you. Goodbye.